We will hear first from Hector Beltran, uh, who is the holder of an ACLS Mellon Dissertation Completion Fellowship and is working currently in the Department of Anthropology at UC Irvine. We will hear next from K.J. Rawson, um, the grantee of a 2017 ACLS Digital Extension Grant. K.J. is an associate professor of English uh, at the College of Ho the Holy Cross. And finally, uh, Caroline Wigginton, a 2017 ACLS Fellowship Carl and Betty Fortzheimer Fellow, and she is an assistant professor uh, of English at the University of Mississippi. So we'll go in that order. Hold your questions. All right, thank you, Terry, for that brief introduction uh, to fellow panelists and to the ACLS for inviting me to share a bit of my work with you today. So at a broad level, my research thinks about practices of activism, software development, and entrepreneurship on both sides of the US-Mexico border and how they come together in the name of community empowerment through technology. So what, I, I'm a 2017 Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellow. And as I was working on finishing my dissertation, now turning it into a book manuscript, I thought about who is my audience? So I've outlined sort of three main publics I want my work to reach. So sort of general audience, uh, the next audience, anthropologists or humanistic social scientists, and then finally, my research participants. So sort of the dream of the anthropologist or of humanistic scholars is that our work gets back to the people uh, we work with. So a general public might say, all right, well, what is it that you did? What is your research about? And we all know the anthropologist does ethnography. So what did I do as an ethnographer? I hung out at a lot of hackathons, in, mostly in Mexico, but also in the US. Does, has anybody been to a hackathon? Oh, great, OK. Shout out some recent hackathons you've been to. What, what were these hackathons in the name of, or what was, what was the purpose of the hackathon? Music. Music. Community. Community engagement. Open data. Open data. Great. Sorry? Games. Games. Gaming, game of fine. Okay. So for those of us who, for those of you who don't know what a, a hackathon might be, hackathon is a ritual event for what I call hacker entrepreneurs. In a span of 48 to 72 hours, participants are expected to meet partners, develop a mobile application or technical infrastructure related to an organizing theme, as you all have called out, into a viable tech startup company, pitch the startup to investor judges. Some, of the, some, of the over, some align with some overarching theme, transportation, health, open data, or are very specific, how to improve the breast pump is one recent hackathon I went to. Final pitch must convey why the startup is an innovative project, what problem it is resolving, and that it is scalable and economically viable in the current market. How important this economic viability is depends on the nature of the hackathon and the sponsors. So some of them are explicitly against techno-capitalism, some that are framed more in terms of community empowerment, sort of leave the financials to the side. By choosing the hackathon as a research site, I build on work by scholars who have analyzed the event as a microcosm of Silicon Valley dynamics, where participants perform mercurial allegiances and work in focused high innovation cycles meant to mimic free market business processes. At my research sites, young hackers and entrepreneurs learn startup methodologies, brainstorm and prototype their projects, and develop pitches that they use to present their ideas to judges. Again, with the general public, they might say, well, why do I care about this? Well, if numbers are important, in 2016, which is one of the years uh, when I conducted my research, someone decided to enumerate the stuff of hackathons. In 2016, they said there were 3,450 events organized, 200,000 plus participants, 
and over 13,000 prototypes created. So that's a lot of stuff, right? But one of the dynamics of the hackathon is that precisely what is made never really gets made at all. Not only in that the prototypes are not completed during the event, but that sometimes the promises of completion, sometimes by sponsoring entities or the participants themselves, never really are brought to fruition. People meet at the events, and after the event, they just shake hands and say goodbye. In my research, I hone in on what I call these politics of making and not making. And I ask, why are the events so popular? Why do participants continue to help stage the hackathon, especially in settings where the promises of rewards and opportunities are largely spectacle? So I want to move away from looking at the final products and what is made to why people are there. I want to ask, what does hacking mean to people? How do they see themselves practicing it? The word itself, hacking, has taken on diverse meanings in the contemporary moment with definitions ranging from your sort of classic hacker in front of the computer, some element of transgression into some technical system, to more broad definitions of repurposing technology for means other than for, it for what it was intended, to other definitions of hacking anything, so some sort of playful tinkering, not necessarily technical. Hacking can take on different meanings and forms, which is why I like to use the term manifestations of hacking as I describe what goes on at these events. When self-identified hackers try to create unifying or global cultural forms, they promote manifestos that claim bogus criteria such as race, class, nation, gender are secondary to what truly matters, the hacking. But what about when markers of difference are important? What happens when the hacker identity is re-territorialized, when difference becomes important to the practice and to what hacking is accomplishing across borders? Which leads me to my next audience. So anthropologists like to talk about difference, and we want to think critically about differences. What can the specific and the particular tell us about would appear to be global cultural forms. In this case, how does the subject position and the subjectivities of the hacker fit into the overarching promise of technology, especially in places constructed as developing countries where we find subjects, subjects constructed as developing or in completion or waiting to be completed? In my research, I explore how hackathons in Mexico aligned with constructions of modernity and national identity. Scientists and engineers are usually ideal subjects in these constructions as they're framed as collaborative rather than agnostic, technical rather than political, and constructive rather than complaining. <laughs> Following capitalistic and developmentalist narratives, these hackathon events and other spaces fit into the larger Me Mexican political economic landscape as spaces to keep these recent graduates busy, as potential generators of companies who, would create, who will create jobs for them and their colleagues, and as a type of infrastructure that could help Mexico emerge on the global innovation stage. During my research, the celebration of entrepreneurial hackers worked within these spaces to help promote a political agenda where young people were asked to appropriate neoliberal discourses about taking initiative, being self-satisfied, not waiting for government, and being socially conscious. But instead of presenting my research participants as these duped neoliberal subjects, or on the flip side, these empowered coding heroes, I want my ethnography to explore how they fill the social space of the hackathon with meaning, hope, and critique. And here's where my research bleeds into the third audience, my research participants themselves. How is it that they use some of their code work or the design principles of software development to think and act in contemporary society? So I know some of you are just itching. To, all right, show me some code. I know I can see it in your faces, right? So. When I'm, sitting, when I'm in these hackathons and I'm coding along with research participants, 
and you can probably not see the code very well here, but I'm also asking questions such as, show me a piece of code you're particularly proud of and why are you proud of it? What are some of the design principles you're using to sort of think about the system you're developing? So yes, some people are creating projects which you might consider uh, explicitly political, you know, working on infrastructure to prevent voting fraud or working on municipal um, issues, uh, thinking about infrastructures that will sort of intervene in day-to-day uh, -day corruption and fraud. But they're also developing projects that create identicons up at the top, which is what this piece of code is creating. So the identicon you, you might see when you log into some system and you don't choose a picture for your avatar. Uh, so this code takes a hash value, usually your IP address, and creates this uh, identicon for you. Doesn't sound very political, but I really want to dig into people who are immersed in code. How is it that they're thinking about their code, but also sort of the context in which they're coding? I'm interested in how people immersed in the code begin uh, use a sort of systems thinking to analyze social relationships and think about other domains of life. So I'm running out of time, but this diagram here is my proposal for what I call full stack ethnography. So on the left hand side, I'm guiding you through the computing stack. So at the very lower level, you get what you would call the zeros and ones, MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field transistors, sort of putting out the zeros and ones, creating gates, you move to the next layer of abstraction, you have logic gates, you sort of abstract away the details and move, move to the next layer of abstraction. So sort of one of the core principles of computer science. You don't have to understand it very well, or I, I think you will though. What I call code work is moving through these different layers of abstraction, but then on the right hand side, I think about how we can use this code work to think about an ethnographic stack. So people are immersed in the code, but they're also in the hackathon, and in all of this, we're thinking about other processes and um, elements, you know, gender, race, political economy, capitalism, how do all of these fit together? So, so in, one, in one particular, all right, so in one particular um, article, what I talk about is how a hacker school in Mexico City sort of uses these principles to move through their relationships with companies and state entities. I think about a very specific coding principle called loose coupling, which we can geek out over um, in the question session, <laughs> and how they use that principle to think about and rethink their relationship with the state and private companies. What's so powerful about the code is that Hacker entrepreneurs construct new forms of mobility by traversing the bottom layers of new technologies where they can observe how different elements are related and how things really work. Software's fundamental appeal is that it has the power to illuminate the unknown, separate software from hardware, interface from infrastructure, provide powerful metaphors for how the system works, whether the system is the latest software infrastructure, a socioeconomic program or political reform. The model itself is a prototype, and I invite you to think with me in these forthcoming publications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector. Our second speaker will be KJ Rawson from the College of Holy Cross, the Holy Cross. So thank you so much, Terry. Good morning. I am both humbled and delighted to be able to take part in this panel for an organization that has had such a transformational impact on both my career and on my work. So my plan is to spend the 15 minutes or so that I have introducing you to my project, the Digital Transgender Archive. And I wanna highlight a few key moments when ACLS funding has supported its development. I wanna begin by sharing with you some of the reasons why I began the project in the first place, and then I'll give you a quick overview of the site before I end with some brief implications on what kinds of inquiry the DTA opens up for humanistic scholarship more broadly. So the Digital Transgender Archive has been online and available since January of 2016, but the project actually began several years before in 2007, which was the year that I really began to understand the need for this work. So at that time, I was a graduate student at Syracuse University, and I was working on my PhD in rhetoric.
I had decided that I wanted to study archives for my doctoral dissertation. I wanted to understand how different types of archives were collecting transgender-related history. So in other words, I was undertaking a historiographic project. Archives were my object of study, and I wanted to understand not only what was collected and by whom, but how it was organized, how materials were described and made accessible to researchers. So I had what I thought was a really great idea, but I came across a problem pretty quickly. I couldn't even locate significant collections of transgender historical materials. So it took me a few months to find them, which I eventually did, but I never forgot that basic struggle for information accessibility that I faced at the onset of this project. And if I, as a graduate student researcher who was trained in archival research methods, could not find transgender history, what might that mean for the state of trans history writ large? So I've since identified a number of barriers that make research in this area quite difficult. And I'm going to talk through four quite briefly here. So the first of those is that materials are widely dispersed. I now understand that there are hundreds of archives that have been collecting transgender history intentionally. But there are thousands more that have important materials in this area that don't actually even know what they have. Now, archivists, when they are aware of these holdings, have not had any good mechanisms to share that information with researchers to help incentivize more uses of their collections. A second barrier is that some collections have little or no online presence, and this is particularly true for queer and grassroots archives, which may be collected in basements, in storage units, in garages. So I'm not even talking about online searchability, I mean even just knowing that the collections exist. A third barrier is that the term transgender itself is a relatively new term. The earliest print usage that I've been able to find is the mid-1960s, and it wasn't widely used in the US until the early 1990s. What this means in an archival context is that very few materials have been described with this terminology, but yet most researchers are only familiar with that term and don't have a broader, broader lexicon and able to conduct successful research in this area. The fourth barrier is that the web is inundated with popular accounts of trans phenomena. And among all of that static, there's actually very little historically accurate information and even less primary source material. It's also challenged by the use of the popular acronym LGBT in all of its variations, which generally only includes the T in name only. So as I became increasingly aware of these barriers, I decided that I wanted to develop a project that would address the problem of the invisibility of trans history. So in 2013, I finally found myself in a position where I could undertake such a project. So I started by enlisting a handful of archival partners who shared my passion for this history and who wanted to contribute materials to a website. I also began doing some grant writing, the all important work of getting funding for the project to get it up and running. So the first grant that I received was an ACLS Digital Innovation Fellowship, which supported the initial development of the site and the database for the 2015-2016 academic year. And it was halfway through that first year of funding that we were able to launch the website publicly. We had an immediate surge of both usage and media coverage, and that quickly validated the need for this resource. And two years later, once we had passed through the initial stages of development, we received a second round of ACLS funding in the form of a digital extension grant. And that grant from the 2017-2017, sorry, 2018 year, supported the expansion of our collection. That year, the project was also awarded a CFW Coker Award by the Society of American Archivists, which recognized our influence on national standards for archival description. So at this point, I just want to take a moment to offer my sincere gratitude for ACLS because it would not be an exaggeration to say that without ACLS, this project would not exist. So given the research barriers that I've just described, it won't be surprising to see in our mission statement that accessibility is so central to our work. 
Our collection includes both digitized historical materials as well as discovery resources, which are things like finding aids and collection guides, so that researchers can be assisted in finding undigitized collections. And this is really important because what we have on our site is just a small fraction of all that is available and collected in physical archives. So how do we decide what to collect? And I apologize for all the text on this slide. Uh, but this is our official scope statement, and it's not only on our website, but it does guide our day-to-day -day acquisitions decisions. So the thing I want to emphasize from this is that we moved away from transgender as an identity term, since it is both historically and culturally out of place. Um, but instead, we treat trans transgender as a practice of transing gender. And in doing that, we dramatically widened our collecting scope, and we attempt to circumvent some of the difficulties of the term transgender itself. And as a rhetorician, I'm happy to talk through some of those if you're interested. So I'm guessing that many of you aren't familiar with our site, so I'm going to take a few minutes to just offer you a very quick overview of what we have in our collection. So we've had two versions of the site since we first launched uh, three years ago. Um, this version was just launched this past October, thanks to the ACLS grant. And we changed the front end of our site to adapt to the mobile audiences that we've found that we've gotten. So around 40% of our users actually come from mobile devices. So you can see here, this is the, the banner on our homepage, that the search bar is front and center. So we want to invite people right away to jump into doing a search of our holdings. There's also opportunities to browse built in, and we added things like type ahead search suggestions akin to Google, so that if you are trying to query the database and you make a spelling error, we'll help you out. <laughs> um, to give you a sense of what's in the collection, um, we have a lab at the College of the Holy Cross, but we don't actually maintain any archival holdings. Instead, we are actually collaborating with 61 different contributing institutions from nine different countries. And these institutions range from private collections all the way through prestigious universities. We have 7,395 total items available, unless they added a few more since I've been here. <laughs> And we expect to hit about 8,000 by this summer. So again, with a project that's only three years old, we're just thrilled by the success that we've been able to have already. The materials date from 1587 to the present, though that's a bit misleading since most of them really are from the second half of the 20th century. And I also wanted to provide you a quick screen grab of our genre breakdown. And just to highlight mostly that photographs and clippings are our most prominent holdings right now. And the other thing I would point out is that we have over 260 finding aids from two do dozen different institutions. So again, just showing you how much material is actually out there beyond what we have in our collection. So when you do a search, this is what the search results page looks like. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see you can toggle different views. This should be a fairly familiar search interface for many of you. Down the left-hand side, there's lots of ways that you can facet your results to limit them. As you continue scrolling down, you'll see additional ways of limiting your results. Again, emphasizing accessibility, we tried to make this front end as easy as possible to facilitate direct access to historical materials for users of our site. So now that the project is up and running and it's getting wide usage, I've been spending most of my time thinking about how it's working. For the last few minutes of this talk, I want to touch upon the implications that this project has for three particular areas digital archives, historical research, and transgender history. Digital archives are increasingly easy to both create and access, and as a result, we will continue to see more and more of them cropping up online. Amidst this rapidly growing interest in digital archives, the DTA offers an innovative thematic digital collection, which provides a mechanism for increasing the accessibility and visibility of otherwise difficult to find historical materials. In addition to having a separate transgender-themed collection, all of our materials are also harvested by Digital Commonwealth and the Digital Public Library of America, which are two much larger digital archives. This further increases the accessibility of our materials, and it ensures that transgender history isn't simply siloed in this separate digital collection.
So here's one example of the type of item that we've been able to make available. This is the first page of a Spanish document that was produced between 1587 and 1589. It is the earliest document in our collection, and it's an account of a, quote, woman who dressed as a, quote, man. There are almost no indicators in this document that would render it searchable for anyone trying to find evidence of tra gender transgressive behavior. So it would be incredibly difficult to discover even with painstaking historical research. It is only because of the existence of the project like the DTA and the collaborative nature of our work that we have been able to find it and make it more readily accessible to researchers. Though I've already started to discuss the implications that this project has for historical research in digital archives in particular, I would argue that it also prompts important considerations for historical research more broadly. Projects like the DTA break open every stage of the traditional archival process and push us to ask new questions about how we select, represent, describe, organize, and make available historical materials, both online and offline. Most of my academic publishing has been in this area and I'm continuing to pursue these kinds of questions. So let me provide one quick example. This is an image of a chess binder from the Sexual Minorities Archives in Western Massachusetts. In this digital representation of a physical artifact, since we are not there next to it, we lose the ability to get a sense of how big it is and how it feels, maybe even how it smells. Though a digital archive might try to compensate for that loss by providing information like dimensions or descriptions, it's not the same as physically encountering it in an archive. Something significant has been lost in the digital representation of this artifact. So this gap between the analog object and its digital surrogate is an important space to interrogate and think through how it's influencing our historical research. So as archives, as digital archives and online historical research becomes more and more prevalent, there's a great deal to consider concerning how our historical research is impacted by digital archives, and of course on the flip side, how digital archives influence our approaches to physical collections of historical materials. Perfect. Not quite yet. I'll blame Terry for that one. <laughs> so there, there's one final implication for the project that I want to talk through, on, and I will end with this. And that's the impact that the DTA has on our understandings of transgender history more specifically. So in short, the DTA helps to document a history that is too often invisible, overlooked, or outright intentionally erased. It's important to note that the purpose of this project isn't only to excavate the positive moments in transgender history, but to document everything that we find. As you would expect, there are a lot of things on the site that are difficult to encounter. There's exploitative and pornographic content. There are accounts of terrible violence and discrimination. There's challenging and emotional stories that too often do not end well. But there's also a great deal to be inspired by. There's so much courage and resilience and commitment to forming community in the face of systematic oppression. This is a photograph of Marie Hogue from the turn of the 20th century. Hogue was a gender-bending Norwegian suffragette whose activism is largely unknown outside of Scandinavia. She's just one quick example of a figure who has not been sufficiently studied by historians or transgender studies scholars. The DTA invites the scholars and the public more broadly to begin delving more deeply into the lives of people like Marie Hogue and so many others who have dared to transgress gender norms. Behind every artifact in this collection, there are individual people whose lives are worth remembering. Transgender people and any person who dares to transgress gender norms continue to face injustice, discrimination, and violence. Yet for most people, transgender lives are a distant abstraction, if they are even considered at all. So the DTA offers one effort to humanize the experiences of all those who have transgressed gender norms throughout human history. And for me, that is perhaps the most important implication of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much.
Caroline. Hello. So first of all, uh, thank you to James Schulman for inviting me to speak today and to Sandra Bradley for doing such an amazing job coordinating. It sounds like she does that for everybody. Uh, and to Terry Castle and my fellow speakers. Um, I also want to thank the ACLS for supporting my scholarship not once, but twice. Um, first in 2011 through 2013 when I was an ACLS new faculty fellow, a postdoctoral program of, as we've just heard. And second, in this past academic year, 2017-2018, when I was an ACLS Carl and Betty Forsheimer Fellow. In both instances, the fellowship was transformative to my career and project. In the first instance, it allowed me to remain in academia and gave me space to push my project. Um, and that uh, project came out a couple years ago as my first monograph uh, in the neighborhood women's publication in early America. Uh, in the second instance, it gave me intellectual space and monetary assistance to conduct additional research, make new connections, reconceive my book's scope, and design new collaborative projects that extend upon its work. And I don't touch upon those collaborative projects in the talk today, but I'm happy to talk about those as well, as well as brainstorm ways to fund them. Um, always looking for that. Um, so to demonstrate how my ACLS fellowship sustained my own work and to make clear how such programs also support emerging themes and methods in humanities scholarship, I'll spend the rest of my time briefly discussing one example from my current book and how my time as an ACLS fellow expanded my evidence and shifted my argument. So my current project is Indigenuity, Native Craftwork, and the Material of Early American Books. Shells, quills, sinew, rock, deerskin, Cochineal. In early America, such natural resources were the ingredients for Native people's craft work. With them, they created objects that told stories, recorded knowledge, and communicated with human and non-human beings. Indigenuity begins in the 17th and 18th centuries and traces how Europeans enfolded the material of Native craft work into their narratives of encounter, using it as physical, informational, commercial, and aesthetic fodder. Extending into the 19th century and beyond, indigenuity also traces how native authors and artists, in turn, adopted European technologies of bookmaking to continue and adapt their community's craft practices. This project emerges from my training and work, uh, first in my central and also in my two secondary disciplines, early American literature, native studies, and book history and bibliography. Early American literary studies is reconsidering its periodizations and geographic and linguistic divisions so as to better account for Native peoples as agents and authors rather than solely as subjects of representation. In Native studies, those like Lisa Brooks, whose second book, um, Our Beloved Kin, just won the Bancroft Prize, and Daniel Heath Justice, who if you've never read his recent manifesto, Why Indigenous uh, Literatures Matter, I highly recommend it. Um, both of them have powerfully argued for the essential and necessary presence of native viewpoints in our literary and cultural histories. As both early American literature and native studies make clear, in indigenous communities, what counts as writing, literature, and communication often does, but often does not, resemble settler colonial versions. At the same time, the fields of book history and bibliography, traditionally housed in literature and history departments, continue to insist on examining European codices as objects, thereby offering enduring methods for studying the thingness of books. Book history has also been inviting more cross-fertilization across disciplines, and its central term, the book, has recently been taken to include, for example, such wide-ranging things as ancient Roman, ancient Roman pottery and digital binary code files. Indigenuity, therefore, relies on the early American literary skills of close reading of words and genres, etc., but also does through interdisciplinary contextualization and attends to visual, tactile, somatic, and sonic valences of the text. Indigenuity acknowledges and builds on key terms like book and colonial era, but uses these as platforms rather than as unnecessarily delimiting the project. So chapter five of Indigenuity exemplifies this approach and also showcases how the fellowship motivated a temporal and geographic expansion of scope. Originally, the chapter was to be solely about 18th century Mohegan leader and minister Joseph Johnson. During the winter of 1772-73, 
Johnson kept a diary while he was a school teacher for the Farmington Indians, a small, mostly Christian community of Tungsis, Quinnipiac, and Wangung families just west of Hartford, Connecticut. What interested me was not so much the diary itself, though it is handmade, uh, but its description and documentation of his pro process for making a handful of what he calls gamuts. He was making these gamuts at the request of the Farmington Indians because soon after he arrived, they had decided to begin holding twice weekly singing meetings. And during the first meeting, they saw his book and they requested their own. So the next morning, Johnson went to town and quote, got paper. Several days later, he made three blank books by cutting them out and sewing them together, he tells us. He began filling the first book immediately. First, he, quote, wrote down the rules. Next, he added musical characters. Then he drew lines. Finally, he, quote, pricked out some tunes, an activity that took several days. After delivering each gamut to one of the Farmington Indians, he would start the next one. In total, he made at least eight of these gamuts, which are uh, clearly music books of some sort. And so on the slide, I have I don't know if this has a little laser pointer, but I have it circled um, a couple places where he talks about pricking out the books. But this is all we know, because none of the gamuts are extant. We are therefore left with many questions. What did Johnson's gamuts look like? What are the rules he refers to? What lyrics, musical characters, and melody melodies did the books contain, if any? To answer these questions, I turned to my book history and bibliography training and started examining other music books. As it turns out, his order of steps and his use of the term gamut suggests that he was repurposing the form of the music book, or sorry, the tune book, an English genre then circul circulating widely in British North America. American printed tune books like the American Harmony, a new and complete introduction to the grounds and rules of music, and the New England Psalm Singer had become prevalent in the Northeast earlier in the 18th century when evangelical Christianity put a stamp of approval on singing. For a long time, you were not supposed to sing. Um, it was sinful. Uh, hymn books were another more popular genre, uh, more popular than the tune books, but hymn books contain lyrics, no music. Uh, these tune books, on the other hand, are more accu accurately music instruction books. They are typically oblong in shape, the better perhaps for reading a long line of music and sharing it with a partner. They explain musical notation, provide a roster of sample songs, often hymns named for particular places in Old and New England, as well as a few other well-known church anthems and canons like the doxology. And they offer rules for three or more part uh, singing. Johnson himself would have become very familiar with the style of singing uh, taught in such tune books when a child at Moore's Indian Charity School. Three-part hymnody was a popular and important component of 18th century native Christian worship, both because music and chant had been a part of ceremonial practices in the Northeast for centuries, if not longer, and because religious leaders, native and non-native alike, used music to evangelize and teach. This analysis might provide a convincing answer to what the gamuts looked like, and even why Johnson had a gamut with him. But to me, it doesn't place the gamuts in their full material context, and it doesn't fully explain why the native converts at Farmington so quickly and impatiently demanded not just to learn a new way to sing together, but to have and to hold their own tune books. The Indians are all desirous of having gamuts, Johnson sighs in his diary, but I am in a continual hurry Nevertheless, I purpose to furnish them with singing books as soon as time will admit." End quote. Their desire and Johnson's frazzled determination makes better sense once the form is placed within a long-standing Northeastern indigenous partnering of music and craft to build and shape relationships. And this is where the ACLS really helped me push um, this particular chapter. Crafted objects had long been used to send a message, invite a conversation, or ratify an agreement. Wampum belts, drums, and rattles participated in songs and dances. An object might share its living memories by inviting a speaker to pick it up, remember a decision, sing a song, or narrate intervening time. Musical notation can function similarly, as holding a tune book and following the song also coheres memory and improvisation, time and bodies. For the tiny multination native Christian community of Farmington, Increasingly encircled and encroached and monitored by settler colonists, perhaps gamuts made and gifted by this new Mohegan school teacher resembled instruments by which they could orchestrate new exchanges and new fellowship between their community and uh, those of Mohegan as well as other local native nations and, uh, and towns. <clears throat> 
My ACLS fellowship, by affording me the opportunity to travel to archives and native communities, helped me consider how the resemblance here is more than metaphorical, as evidenced by a juxtaposition of tomb book pages with the crafted objects of diplomacy and peoplehood in the native Northeast. Native craft workers in the Northeast adorned woven baskets and boxes with four-lobed medallions, angular and curved lines, dots and diamond stockades. These painted and carved designs represent the journeys, locations, and relationships of native persons and nations. Their undulating arcs invite the eye and the finger to trace the trails left and right, up and down, northeast, south, and west. Baskets and boxes are both decorative, communicatory, and useful. Their service designs connect them to other ceremonial and quotidian objects. Placing items inside containers recollects homecoming, even as dots on the container's surface symbolize presence, removal, and journey. A round box, like the one pictured here um, in the upper right, um, which was sent to Mohegan in 1785 by another community, encourages revolution of or with the artifact, an endless, multidimensional, and embodied performance that enacts ongoing and remembered connection between native peoples and communities. In this way, these containers resemble wampum, whose patterns are similarly both tactile and visual. Here, the linear strands and two-tone beads produce graphic and angular designs. They recall the repetitive labor of bead making and weaving, and the ways that native diplomacy and ceremony can combine craft, text, narrative, song, and dance. So when you take a, a wampum belt um, back to your community after a, a diplomatic council, um, you would often uh, recapitulate um, the agreement, not just in terms of words, but also by singing the songs that you had learned about the wampum belt from the, the community it had come from. So compare these indigenous craft objects to European, um, Euro-American tomb books. I'm not sure how to go back, but I'm sure you've all seen um, uh, manuscript music before and printed music, so picture the, the previous slide. The book's staves with long stacked lines and contrasting dark and light notes evoke the patterns and texture of wampum. The undulating sweep of the harmonies and the curving arcs connect groups of notes, and in doing so, recall the medallions, trails, and dots that ornament baskets. Uh, reading wampum and multi-part hymn, hymn singing are similarly collective activities that place holding, touching, sharing the craft object at the center of a group. For the period's indigenous Christians, hymn singing could articulate with and adapt familiar, tangible expressions of community identity and expression in which diplomacy, material craft, and music were co-partners. In this light, the Farmington Indians' impatient demand for their own gamuts, perhaps with room to add their own painted and inked designs, is unsurprising. By placing Johnson's diary and its documentation of now lost gamuts in the context of both tomb books and native craft work in diplomacy, and by thinking about these different text material content and form, including the visual and tactile, I arrived at the realization that Johnson's gamuts helped bring the households of Farmington Indians together in song and connected them to the scattered native towns of his region. What I also determined was that Johnson's gamuts and his winter in Farmington were inextricable from what came next, not just for him, but for the community as a whole. By the spring, Johnson had begun journeying around the region to collaborate upon the establishment of a new Christian native nation and refuge, Brotherton, to be located in Oneida. He died not long after, unfortunately, uh, but Brotherton was indeed founded and continues today, though it is now in Menominee, which is in present-day Wisconsin. Its founders and first residents included most of those Farmington Indians, and records of its early years are rife with accounts of hymn singing and craft work. I suspect this is why Johnson's gamuts are lost. They journeyed west with the Farmington Indians. My chapter, therefore, similarly now migrates west uh, uh, as well, taking into account how other native authors from Johnson's community similarly manifest visions of native community, communal unity through their crafting of music books. Well, I don't have time to go into detail, obviously. I'll briefly point to Brotherton Narragansett, Thomas Com Comic's 1845 printed book, uh, Indian Melodies, a published tomb book whose form and content suggestively uh, evoke what I think the form of Johnson's Gamets was. As a printed text, it proclaims, materializes uh, Brotherton's permanent permanency through the arrangement of ties internal to Brotherton and the arrangement of connections to other native nations. And I'm happy to talk about this, this further. Um, 
Um, and the chapter I also now conclude with contemporary Mohican composer Brent Michael Davis of the Stockbridge Muncie native community. Um, this community co-migrated with Brotherton first to Oneida and then to Menominee. Um, David's graphic scores combine visual and verbal artistry with music notation in order to envision a continental indigenous community that for him remains grounded in seasonal rhythms and philosophies of place and home. So the ACLS afforded me the opportunity to research and write not just about Johnson, but to consider how his book craft was part of a larger and, and longer indigenous history of choreographing voices, bodies, and places in order to compose new visions of community, first centered in the native Northeast, then the new native Christian nation of Brotherton, and lastly, an interconnected continental indigenous presence, which, okay, <laughs> sounds good, I'm getting there. Um, so this brings me back to my first slide um, because it emblematizes for me how the ACLS transformed my project and approach and thereby testifies to how the ACLS broadly sponsors emerging themes and methods in humanities research. This is Sarah Sense's work, uh, Grandparent Stories. Sense is a contemporary Choctaw and Chinimaca uh, multimedia visual artist. She combines research into her community's traditional practices, content and archival collections, and apprenticeship with global indigenous artists, <coughs> artists to produce her art. Conversations and collaborations with artists like her, aided by my ACLS fellowship, is helping me understand early American texts and connect them to contemporary practices. Um, while, I'm ha while I am an early Americanist, having the ACLS gave me time to more deeply query my own approach and the ways I might weave together multiple disciplinary techniques and build on new approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> well, Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, uh, these talks, each one fascinating in a different way, uh, makes me feel incredibly old, uh, probably you know, 200 years old uh, compared to uh, my panel mates. Um, each one is, in a way, these are, mo to me, very moving talks because what you see so clearly in each situation is the identification of a new object of study, uh, one that has either not been uh, carefully considered or fully considered, and in some cases, a kind of brand new topic, as in Hector's uh, ethno history of hacking. Um, I want to ask for questions in a moment, but let me ask my, my uh, presenters, first of all, if they would like to comment on each other's projects in any way. Uh, at first, it seems there are few overlaps, but actually, uh, I think there are perhaps more than at first appear. So, would anyone like to say something? <laughs> sure, I'll say something very quickly. Um, one thing I noticed among all of us is the effort to recuperate and to think about objects of study and what is at stake in those objects of study, not just for the objects themselves, but for all of the communities that are behind yes. those objects. And then, yeah. of course, their continuing relevance today. So I, I think that was a theme that emerged for me as I listened. That's awesome. <laughs> May I ask you a question, KJ? Um, I sort of rehearsed a version of this um, earlier, but with transgender archival work, it would seem to me that there's a huge amount of stuff that already exists in women's history archives and lesbian and gay archives. And I wonder if those sources for things like, say, Renaissance gender subversions, um, you know, there are classic books from the 1980s, Alan Bray's book and discussion of the Molly Clubs and so on. To what extent are you shifting things into uh, your new archive. To a great extent, yeah. So we actually spend a lot of our time working with archivists to say, hey, this is actually relevant to the kinds of histories that we're trying to make more accessible to researchers. So in many ways, we're reaching very far and 
it would make sense for us to collect things like artifacts related to Amelia Bloomer, for example, though mm -hmm. you might be surprised to see her under a transgender umbrella. Mm -hmm. But that's precisely yeah. why we're continuing to trouble this, this term transgender as the umbrella and the reason for why we collect these materials because many experiences that transgender people have are in common with many, many others who have transgressed gender norms and who have fought back against all of the oppressive structures that have dictated a very limited space in which gender expression is legible and, and culturally accepted. Great, thank you. Let me open up two questions for our three panelists. Um, yes, Anne. I was just thinking of another way of bringing you all together, and I really owe this to a dissertation defense I did two weeks ago uh, for one of my students whose dissertation began with the concept of before transgender. It morphed in the course of his research. It's mostly about the 19th century. Amelia Bloomer figures in there in a major way. And he came to the concept of gender migrants. And so I realized that that's another way of thinking about your three projects together. They are about forms of migration or movement. In Caroline's story, it's really about how an archive is sort of lost or disassembled in the course of a migration. I found these all really fascinating. And I wondered if you could think a little bit about the kinds of metaphoric language you use to describe your project and whether it's about you know, migration or borders or barriers or community formation. How, what language you use to get at the kinds of things that you're trying to do. So anyway, thank you all for your work and your presentations about it. I thought it was fantastic. So I, um, I really enjoyed Hector's concept of, of the whole stack or the complete stack. I probably have the wrong term at the, at the beginning of it, but the stack, right? <laughs> um, the, the term that I often think of is, at least in this particular chapter, is choreographing, like what's being choreographed. Um, um, which to me is a, 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 and what's being woven together. But it also strikes me that um, thinking about what is the, the data, what is the evidence, what is the, um, the set of materials that one places at the bottom changes how things stack up, right? Like where, what you put on, on, on the top. And I think that sometimes our, our disciplines presume um, that, it's gonna, th that we should always put one thing at the bottom of, mm -hmm. of the stack, um, but that, uh, but that I think that these all just point to, I'm probably not making any sense, but I'm, <laughs> but it just, to me, just seems really transformative to change what's at the bottom of the stack. Um, and if you're up here and you're, you're talking about literature, or you're talking about um, uh, gender history, or you're talking about um, how, how politics is working in contemporary Mexico, it might not occur to you to put something different at the bottom of the stack. Um, so I really like that. Personally, I really loved that, that idea. To, and, to, and to build on the stack, I really like KJ's move to not think about transgender, but the practice of transing gender. And I thought about an over-line uh, theme at the conference between last night and today is, yes, there's going to be more STEM funding, but how do we sort of fight for the humanities or sneak them back into um, sort of these different fields? And I thought, well, what about uh, building on the stack, you know, thinking about the classroom where I'll be teaching engineers and scientists mostly, well, what about transing the stack? What about queering the stack <laughs> as, as, as a serious intervention in these technologies? And as you're building these technologies, thinking about these uh, themes and um, different ways of being in the world. Yeah. Are there questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Short, short question about the history of the word hack. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you know about it? Well, people have done different genealogies. Um, I think Alex Galloway at NYU writes um, one particular genealogy where he traces it back to, uh, historians help me out here, 16th century or 14th century golf in Scotland, mm -hmm. where it's about <laughs> getting the ball into the hole, so sort of hacking your way <laughs> until you get it in. So that's sort of one particular gene genealogy of thinking about it, like doing it until you sort of get it done, but it also can mean sort of more of an elegant solution, um, sort of this beautiful hack, and I think Biela Coleman writes more about the sort of hacking sublime when you're immersed in the code and you come up with the solution. That is a hack. So you see these two different ways of thinking about it and how they've transformed in, in, in history. Mm 
What about hack writers? To go back to my <laughs> period, the 18th century. Grub Street hacks. Um, <laughs> is there a connection here? <laughs> yes, there isn't. <laughs> can, you say, can you say more about the hack writers? Well, hack, a hack writer is someone who writes for money and doesn't really have a lot of artistic goals in mind. Uh, is, yeah, pulp, <laughs> pulp writers. Uh, it all began in the 18th century in London uh, in an area called Grub Street. So they're part of a new commercial market for writing not attached to patronage or traditional structures of you know creating art yeah. so anyway <laughs> <laughs> you're so new this you know you'll, you'll be like who is it uh, the giant that everyone else is standing on top of i could i can speak to <laughs> hack writers uh it's derived from hackney as in the hackney horse uh, and it means a jaded, worn out job yes. uh, horse. And then of course it becomes a hack, it's in a taxi. So I don't know if there's a connection there or not. <laughs> it's often a pejorative, it was shaded towards a pejorative meaning. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, these were incredibly um, inspiring and engaging presentations about really remarkable things. I had a question about the trans um, archive because I worked with a student who does work on the science of rape. And um, one of the challenges was how do we talk about um, what happens to um, those who are trans, right, so that they don't fit definitions of, of rape. And it was almost impossible to find, so he, he did this amazing work through all of the journal entries for the last like 40 years, all of the journal articles about the science of rape. And in order to try to talk about trans folks or queer folks um, in relation to these questions, they're not in any of those databases at all. You have to go to queer specific um, archives in order to make that connection. So I just wanted to sort of ask you, um, in the work that you're doing, how you might be um, able, some of what you're doing might kind of uh, begin to address that kind of problem of the ways in which that stuff becomes invisible in this sort of larger literature. So thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I think my approach is generally to try to do a both and. So to have separate spaces where we can pull together in my case, historical materials, but you could also imagine research tools, scholarship that directly addresses communities that are being oppressed and marginalized and underrepresented in these other spaces, but to also make sure that those materials are not completely siloed, right? Because we don't want to evacuate these other broader spaces from these materials that are, that are being excluded in the first place. And so I think that the, to the extent that we can continue to enrich and have both at the same time, it can be tremendously useful. But I, it's also important to continue challenging the logic of what is made accessible in the first place, right? Of what is, what's in DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America, and what isn't that's necessitating us to create these separate spaces in the first place. So what are the logics of collecting? And actually, I think this goes back to the previous comment in that we're always having to think about what counts as historical, right? And who, what communities have the means to create materials, to preserve them, and then to donate them to archives later. Of course, we're replicating other hierarchies of power that we're very well familiar with, right? So in our case, we have to go out and constantly trouble what counts as historical in order to be able to rewrite otherwise, for example, all white histories and all middle and upper class histories, because th this is a real problem and we don't want to continue perpetuating that. So for example, we collect a lot of oral histories, which provide later opportunities to try to recuperate some of the history that may not have been preserved in these other more legible mechanisms um, and donated to archives and other channels, right? So, Again, I think we're, just, we're starting the work, but councils like this allow the opportunity to continue pushing and incentivizing scholars to help furthering this scholarship. Thank you, KJ. Yes, it's, um, you're all, uh, oh, 
sorry. Uh, I, that, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got time for perhaps one more quick question. We've got one. Yes. I had a question about, um, about that was fascinating the way you were saying that the Wampum, the Wampum Belt was serving as a kind of notation for the songs, um, which, were, which were a way of recounting what had happened. And so I was thinking about all those objects as a kind of notation, and also the purposes of notation and whether it exists, whether musical notation, or I guess any kind of, of inscription exists as a guide for what you're supposed to do, or whether it's there as a trace of something, a trace of a performance that already happened. And um, so that's just kind of a rumination on, and are, is that something you're sort of dealing with in the, in so, the project? So I think that, I mean, I think the, the both and uh, statement is, is good because it, it, in some ways it also depends on disciplines and communities and fields. I know I've spoken with um, musicologists who uh, have, have suggested such things that, that um, uh, and Brent Michael Davids, who, who I ended with, I mean, for them, uh, a, uh, a musical text is really living only in the moment of performance, right? Um, and that, for them, is the most uh, important aspect that, um, or not all musicologists, but some that I've, I've spoken with. I'm sure there are other opinions in the world of musicology <laughs> on that. <laughs> Don't want to paint with a broad swath of field that I am not an expert in. Um, uh, then I've also spoken with a number of, um, well, for example, Marge Bruchak, who's an anthropologist at Penn. Um, one of the things that she does with research teams of students is goes around to different archives and finds wampum belts. And for some people, the and a wampum belt in, in an archive, um, which to from some perspectives might be a, a place of, of safety and um, and collection to them. Uh, reads as a prison, uh, reads as a moment of theft. Um, so I think that as if we bring that back to, to musical notations and, and these other craft objects, that um, it's a both and, right? There's both the, 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 um, the importance to me as a scholar that here is something that retains information, that retains history, that retains narrative, that retains memory, um, but maybe where it is, that memory is not being activated. And it's the, and communities themselves um, are the, the best guides to, to whether something is in, in the, the place it needs to be. Thank you, Carolyn. I remembered what I was gonna say, which is that each one of you in various ways is using oral history um, and that, seems an interesting phenomenon to me. Um, we're, our time has run out, um, and I want to thank all three of our panelists. They worked well together, and um, indicate at least three new directions in the humanities and relevant social science. So thank you for coming.